All right, let's get started. Um, today we are going to uh, complete our discussion of consumer choice by actually coming back and deriving the demand curve that we started the semester with, actually showing you how from the limited set of tools we've given you, we can actually derive the underlying demand curves that we see in this class. I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture then talking about the elasticity of demand, what determines the shape of that demand curve. I'll talk about how changes in income affect demand. And then we'll come and we'll come back and talk about the effects of a price change. And we'll talk about sort of the theoretical concepts underneath how you analyze a change in price in the economics model. So let's start with deriving demand curves. Deriving demand curves. OK, so we started in this class with the demand and supply curve. And I said we'd tell you where they came from. So basically, we're now going to talk about how do you derive from the tools we've learned so far the relationship between price and quantity demanded, the downward sloping relationship between price and quantity demanded that we showed you in the very first lecture. So let's, to do so, let's return to our example from last time. Remember, example from last time is utility function was of the form u equals p times c. Okay. Your parents had given you an income of $72 with which you could buy pizza and cookies. Pizza at a price of $12 and cookies at a price of $6. OK? That was the parameters of our example from last time. And once again, remember, all I've done is given you stuff here. Obviously, you're, this, this part is non-controversial. It's a price for pizza in the market. It's the price of cookies in the market. There's an income, there's the amount of money your parents give you. That's not uncontroversial. And this is just a sensible assumption of what someone's preferences might look like. All I'm saying is with these four things, we are done. With these four things, we can now derive a demand curve. And how's that? Well, let's start by looking at it graphically in figure 4.1. Okay? Figure 4.1, on the left-hand side, is exactly the kind of indifference curve analysis that we did last time. So we start with budget constraint BC1. Okay? That is something where you could either get up to 12 cookies and no pizza or up to six pizzas and no cookies. Okay? And we know from analysis last time, given this, we showed you last time, and you went home and practiced, and we're so excited you told your mom and everything. We told you how you could show that you'd want, that you'd want six cookies and three slices of pizza at a point like point A. Okay, we showed that last time. Now, we also talked about what happened when the price changes. So for example, imagine that the price of cookies rises to $9. Okay? Well, we know if the price of cookies rises to $9 is that you could still on your budget afford six pizzas. So the y-intercept does not change, but the x-intercept changes. Now, you can only afford eight cookies. So you move to BC2, sub 2. You used to be able to used to be, be able to afford 12 cookies, not going to afford 8 cookies. And most importantly, the slope of the budget constraint has steepened. Remember, what is the slope of the budget constraint? It's the slope of the budget constraint. The slope is minus PC uh, over PP. That's the slope. And that's steepened because the price of cookies has risen. So you now have a steeper budget constraint. The slope used to be minus a half. Now it's minus 3 quarters. So now that's gone from minus a half to minus three quarters with this new higher price for pizza, uh, higher price of cookies. I'm sorry, and the price of cookies goes to nine dollars. That budget constraint has steepened. Okay, what does this do to demand for cookies? Well, we find the highest tangency of your indifference curves with this new budget constraint, and you could solve mathematically to show that that will occur at point B, where you will choose to continue to have three slices of pizza, but to only have four cookies. That is what happens if you take this, you do constrained optimization. If you change this price to nine, re-optimize the way we showed you last time, you'd end up finding that you would want, um, you would want uh, uh, four, uh, three slices of pizza and four cookies at point B. OK? Now, what if instead the price of cookies fell to $4? So cookies got, more, got cheaper. Well, in that case now, you could still only afford six slices of pizza. So the y-intercept, once again, doesn't change. But the x-intercept now moves out to 18. 
because now you can afford 18 cookies. So your new budget constraint is flatter. It's BC sub 3. It's the flatter outermost budget constraint. Your opportunity set is much larger because cookies are cheaper. You have the same amount of money from your parents, but it can buy more stuff and you can buy more cookies. So your opportunity set is larger. So you now can reoptimize with a now flatter budget constraint. The slope, instead of being a half, has now fallen to a third. Okay, the price cookies over the, but the price cookies is $4. The price cookies over the price of pizza is now a third. So an absolute value, the slope is lower. So you can now, and we say that if you take the same utility function and optimize at the new price, at a price of cookies of $4, you will find that you will choose point C. Still three slices of pizza, but now nine cookies. So all three of those points, we simply did by doing the, redoing the optimization I did last time. By taking this utility function, maximizing it, subject to a budget constraint dictated by these parameters. And all I did was change this parameter twice. Once I may change it up, once I change it down. OK, questions about that? Well, you've now derived a demand curve. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, question. So this also changes the indifference curve? No, your fundamental, your indifference curves are determined by utility function. Your indifference curves do not change. It changes which indifference curve you end up choosing because the tangency point changes. But the only way to change the difference curve would be to change utility function. Difference curves purely come from this part of it. So difference curves come from here. Budget constraint comes from these three pieces. OK? Yeah? It is possible to have a lot of people with like different, like different and different curves and electrical and long range control and different and different curves. Is that possible? Well, no. But it is possible to take a bunch of demand curves and agglomerate them to get one demand curve. And I'm going to talk about that later. But no, in difference curves, you can't really add up. Because remember, utils are not a thing. So you can't add up in difference curves. But if you want to add people, what you would have demand curves. And we've now derived the demand curve. How have we done that? Well, what's the demand curve? It's the relationship between price and quantity. Well, I just showed you the relationship between price and quantity. When the price goes down, quantity of cookies goes down, goes up. When the price goes up, quantity of cookies goes down. Well, you just shift over to the right-hand side of figure 4.1. There's a demand curve. I just graphed these three points. I just graphed for each of the different price of cookies I gave you how many cookies are demanded. Okay, well, at a price of cookies of six, our initial price, geez, this is really small, uh, six cookies was, were demanded. Okay, when the price of cookies goes up to eight, I'm sorry, when it goes up to nine, only four cookies are demanded. When the price of cookies falls to four, point C, then nine cookies are demanded. So literally, we've just derived the demand curve. Starting with these primitives, your tastes, your preferences, and your budget constraint, we've derived a demand curve. And that's it. That's where demand curve comes from. OK? And that is, um, that's essentially uh, what is underneath the demand curve. What's underneath the demand curve is the fact that as the reason demand curves slope down, OK, is that as the price goes up, you want less of the good. Because with a given utility function, as that price goes up, you want less of the good. And that's why demand curve slopes down. OK? So we've just derived that. OK, questions about that? Yeah? Uh, it's always true that like, regardless of your utility function, like, you always want three points. Of, I, I guess Great it's question. Did you peek at my notes? No, because you, if you had, you would have said that's exactly the question I would have asked you. So since you asked me, I'll answer it. No, it is not always true. In fact, that is a feature of this particular utility function I've chosen. This particular utility function I've chosen gives the feature that the demand for a good is a function only of your income and that good's price, not of the other good's price. That's a feature of this. That's why we like this utility function. Okay, it has that nice feature. In general, that's not true. In general, when the price of one good changes, it will affect the demand for all goods, not just that good itself. So the more general utility function, that would not be true. With this utility function, it gives what's called the flat price consumption curve. Okay, not a term you need to know, but just if you want to be more technical which is basically, with this utility function, demand for any good is a function only of its own price and your income. Therefore, when other prices change, it doesn't affect the demand for that good. But that is not generally true. In general, when you change the price of one good, demand for all goods changes. OK? Questions about that? OK, yeah? Is this why you chose like, 3 as a constant? Just... Oh, it wouldn't matter what number I'd chosen. 
But the bottom line is the number, as the price of cookies changes, the number of pizza slices would never change. Demand it would never change. That's the feature of this, of this particular utility function. It's a nice feature of it. Okay. Once again, that comes to this trade-off with modeling. I've chosen a simplified utility function with this nice feature that's almost certainly not true. Okay. But we once again allow, it allowed us to derive a very sensible demand curve without introducing other complications. Okay. Now, what determines the sh this demand curve's particular shape? What determines the shape of this demand curve? And that leads us to the second topic I want to cover today, which is the elasticity of demand. The elasticity of demand. What determines the shape of a demand curve is what we call the elasticity of demand, which we define as, we define the elasticity of demand, epsilon, as delta Q over Q over delta P over P. It's the percentage change in quantity for a percentage change in price. So for example, if quantity falls by 2% for every 1% increase in price, that's the elasticity of demand of negative 2. The elasticity of demand, as long as demand curves are downward sloping, is less than 0. Because the price goes up, quantity falls. OK? So elasticity of demand is less than 0. OK? Uh, and less, I'm sorry, less than equal to 0. Less than or equal to 0. Yeah? Uh, great question. When we're doing this, if we did it in calculus, it would be infinitesimal epsilon change. So it wouldn't matter if it was new or old quality. When you do it discreetly, use the old quantity. OK, so I should say Q0 and P0. Once again, if you did this in calculus, which is the way we're sort of thinking about an underlying intuition, it's an epsilon change, so Q0 and P0 are epsilon. It doesn't really matter. But if you do it discreetly, you'd want to use Q0 and P0. OK, these are great questions. Keep them coming. OK, now, whenever we think of constants like elasticity, it's always useful to think about the extremes. So what are the extremes this measure? One extreme would be if the elasticity demand was 0. We would call that perfectly inelastic demand, would be epsilon equals 0. Now, extremes never exist in the real world. Okay? But, we can, but there are cases that come very close. So can someone, without flipping the page of the handout, don't do it, because someone before flipping the page of the handout, give me an example of a good that might have perfectly in a, very, very, very inelastic demand where no matter the price, you'd still want the same quantity. Yeah? Like you, you, w water, something that's essential to life like water. What else? Yeah, in the way back. Uh, insulin. Well, insulin is the classic example we use. OK, yeah? Uh, sewage removal. Sewage removal is interesting, although not quite, because we see a lot of variation around the world in sewage removal. But something like that, basically essentials of life. Insulin is a classic example we use. Indeed, that's the example I do use. Uh, in the next, oh, I guess I didn't list it on here, so you could have turned the page. Uh, we think about perfectly elastic demand. Someone, once again, for those of you who don't know about the medical science here, basically, if you're diabetic, you have trouble controlling your blood sugar. Insulin is a medicine you need to take to help you control your blood sugar. Without it, you die. So you'd think that's pretty inelastic demand. Like, I want to live, so I'm going to want to have my insulin. And if the price goes up, I'm not going to say, now nah, I'll just die. Okay? You're going to want to still have the insulin. So we think in that case, quantity would be fixed at some Q which is the insulin you need to live, and it wouldn't really matter what the price is. So the elasticity would be zero. You have a perfectly inelastic curve. Quantity would not change with price. Okay? Basically, that would happen when there is no plausible substitute. Okay? The reason water is not as good as insulin is because I can drink something else. And sewage removal, I can do other things to deal with the sewage in my house. But insulin, there is no substitute. I die. OK? So basically, the bottom line is the, when there's no plausible substitute, it may be perfectly inelastic. Likewise, we consider, yeah? Couldn't there be like multiple companies that sell insulin? So like if one, say, increases the price, they would shift when OK, but this is a market. I'm, I, I, that's a great point. I'm just doing this as, uh, let's actually imagine there's one company for now. You're right. I'm not doing choice across companies. OK? Um, so, that would be, so that would be perfectly inelastic. We can also see the other extreme, perfectly elastic. So what's an example? Perfectly elastic demand 
perfectly elastic demand is that uh, perfectly elastic demand is that epsilon equals negative infinity. Okay. So what are, what what would cause perfectly inelastic demand? So people raise their hand and, and tell me. Perfectly perfectly elastic a uh, perfectly elastic demand. I'm sorry. What would cause perfectly elastic demand? What would cause it? I'm just gonna try to spread it around a little bit. You two have been good. Yeah. Would it be something that's like very not necessarily diamond? Well, that's interesting. I mean, it wouldn't. That's not. I'm gonna come to that. But that wouldn't. That's something where demand would be less elastic, but not perfectly, not close to perfectly elastic. Because basically, well, let me ask the question this way: What would drive a good to very, very elastic demand in general? Yeah. Perfect substitution. Exactly. Perfect substitutes. Diamonds, like, don't have perfect substitutes. I mean, they're, we're increasingly making fake diamonds that are better and better substitutes, but a real diamond still doesn't have a perfect substitute. So what does? What's an example? What's something with a, good sub, with a very good substitute? Uh, yeah. A spork. A spork. <laughs> there is no sub. I am insulted <laughs> that you would suggest that the great spork. You need two different things. To replace a spork. Yeah, but then you buy a spoon and a fork. No, I reject your spork suggestion. I'm just joking. No, what, what else? What, what else? What, what is something that's really good substance? Yeah. Like off-brand medication. Yeah, something which is an off-brand medication, or like I like to think of like a fast food. Okay, like 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 fast food burgers have pretty good substance. Fast food pizza. Okay. Uh, basically, it's, once again, it's hard to think of an extreme example. Nothing's ever perfectly elastic. But things which have very good substitutes, okay? Typically, this works well when we think across brands. Okay, if you think about different brands of gum, geez, I mean, who the hell cares? Or different brands of fast food, yeah? What about something like a $5 gift card, where like, after $5, nobody's going to buy it? That's a separate issue. Let's come back. That's sort of a separate, that's like a, key, a weird kinked budget constraint. That's not really about substitution. But the bottom line is, we don't need more examples. The bottom line is, we, the key element, to, and, and we show that in figure 4.3, that's going to be a horizontal demand curve. With a perfectly elastic demand, you have a horizontal demand curve. And therefore, price never changes. Because um, with a perfectly elastic demand, this, it's sort of a weird way to think of perfectly elastic demand. The way it works is if, if I ever charge, with her last debate, if I ever charge a price one epsilon above someone else, I'd lose all my business. And if I charge a price one epsilon below everyone else, I would have the entire market. Because if it's perfectly elastic, like if one pack of gum, I don't know what these stupid gum thing, orbits and ellipse or whatever, if they charge like a penny more than someone else, no one would buy them, they'd go out of business. Okay, that's the idea here. And that's why the price can't change. The price is fixed, so if anyone deviates from that price, Boom, they either lose the market, get the whole market, yeah. Um, would the market for like dollar bills be, be, be like perfectly elastic? Like, but there's not really a market for dollar bills. <laughs> there's not really, I mean, you could say the demand for cash in general might be fairly elastic because you have credit cards and things like that. That's an interesting idea, yeah. So basically, when you have perfectly elastic demand, you end up with sort of this constant price and quantity, and, and quantity changes, but price doesn't change, okay? So that's kind of the extremes. Um, now, um, uh, in, um, so in general, we have goods that are more and less elastic. Okay? In general, we end up within this range, between perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic. The bottom line is, here's the intuition I want you to have. What determines elasticity is substitutability. The more substitutable goods are, the more elastically demanded they are. Okay? So now, now I want to go on to another topic, which is related which is we talked in our example about what happened when I change prices. What about when I change income? So the third topic I want to talk about is what happens when income shifts. And how does that affect demand curves? When income shifts, how does that affect demand curves? OK? Well, we could do the same exercise we did before. We did an exercise before where we said, well, let's just use the tools we used before to solve for your new choices at different prices. Let's just solve for your choice of different income. So let's go to figure 4.4. Four. OK? Figure 4.4. Four. Once again, we start with BC1. Same parameters as before. Same setup as before. OK? We choose point A. Now let's say I raise your income. 
from $72 to $96. You've done well. Your parents are giving you more money. $96. Well, in that case, you will choose to have both more pizza and more cookies. Given this utility function, you will choose the point, you will choose point B. Okay? You will choose point B. Okay? Likewise, if I lower your income from $72 to $48, then you will choose point C. Okay? So as your income goes up, you'll choose more of both. As your income goes down, you'll choose less of both. Okay? So now, once again, you'll notice this. Well, let me come to that. So basically, what that says is I can trace out the relationship between how your income changes and how your demand for cookies change. I can then graph that on the next graph and generate what's called the Engel curve. The Engel curve is the relationship between income and quantity demanded. And we'll come back to why this matters. Okay? The Engel curve is the relationship between income and quantity demanded. Now here the Engel curve is linear. Once again, that's just a feature of this utility function. In general, it doesn't have to be linear. But here the Engel curve is linear. That's just because of the way we structure this utility function. Okay? And the, the slope of the angle curve is what we call the income elasticity of demand, okay, gamma, which is delta Q over Q, Q0 once again, if we're doing it discreetly, over delta Y over Y0. That's the income elasticity of demand, okay? Now, the, now, let me just say, um, let me just say one, one comment here about this, because there's sort of a big cheat that uh, I'm doing here with all this that I need you guys to be aware of, which is, which is uh, constant elasticity versus linear curves. We know a constant elasticity curve will not be linear. Okay, if it's linear, it's not constant elasticity, because the elast if, it's, if it's linear, the elasticity will change along the curve. Okay, so the demand curve I just wrote, I drew in figure 4.1, that was a constant elasticity demand curve. That's why it was curved. This angle curve I drew here would not be constant elasticity because it's linear. You, could, you can calculate for yourself that the percentage change, the income elasticity will shift as you go along this curve. And you can show, that, you can show yourself that. What we're going to do in this class is we're going to draw linear constant elasticity curves, which is, of course, technically wrong. Just think of them as blown up versions of a large demand curve. Everything is locally linear, right? Once again, for an epsilon change, everything is linear. So the truth is, we'll cheat a little bit and often draw linear constant elasticity curves. And I want to own that that's a cheat, OK? But just if everything is really local, it's not that bad a cheat, OK? So, so that's kind of how we're going to, that, that's sort of a cheat we're going to do constantly through this course. And we'll be very clear if, 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 if we have clear any problems or anything if we need you to, 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 uh, to deviate from that. OK? Now, what we have here, in addition to a linear angle curve, is we have an upward sloping angle curve, or positive income elasticity. We call goods with a positive income elasticity normal goods. Goods where the more money you have, the more of them you want, we call normal goods. OK, because that's sort of normal. However, it is also true that a number of goods in the world actually have gamma less than 0. And we call those inferior goods. Why would a good be inferior? Why, when your income goes up? Yeah? Exactly. Any examples I can think of? Yeah? Maybe on like fast food at a restaurant down even like you, there's a minimal amount of food you have to eat. And then, like, then they'll you know, pick your fast food and then have to get more money. Exactly. Great example. Yeah, in the back. Omega watches versus Rolex watches? Uh, I wouldn't think of them as an inferior, either of them as inferior, relative they may be inferior. But obviously, when your income goes up, you're not going to suddenly, you know, you're going to want more of both. Okay? Whereas fast food, you actually would want less of it as your income goes up. Literally, you will eat at McDonald's less if you're richer. You're not going to have fewer watches if you're richer. Okay, so the bottom line is that you, inferior goods, you're actually getting to, it's, it's a bit subtle when you about different goods of the same kind. Let's think about classes of goods rather than brands of goods. Once you get across brands, you're right. Let's think about classes of goods. Watches, luxury watches in general are clearly not inferior. Fast food may be inferior. 
Literally, richer people may eat probably less fast food than poorer people. OK, yeah? Um, would something like a refrigerator count where after you buy one, you don't really need more of them? Well, that's like a quant. That's, that, that could be right. But um, yeah, uh, I think not, because the bottom line is rich guys are, gonna have, are much more likely to have two refrigerators than one. So it's a, this discreteness problem. It's, it's too discreet to really use an example. But I think fast food's a great example. The class example we use is potatoes. OK, we're like, in the old days, like before fast food, like that was the cheap, filling, shitty tasting food stuff that guys sort of used, ate all the time. And now, like when they have money, they say, I'm going to move on to steak. And they eat less potatoes. OK? So something where, essentially, you'd rather shift to something else you have more money is inferior. OK? Now, moreover, within that, within normal, we're going to draw a distinction between what we call luxuries and necessities. Luxuries are going to be good where gamma is greater than 1, and necessities gamma is less than 1. So we're going to say, essentially, the question is proportional to your budget. What happens if your income goes up? In other words, do you spend more and more? They're both normal goods. The richer you are, the more you buy of it. But a luxury good is you spend even larger share of your, of your budget on that good as you get richer. So that'd be luxury, like watches, boats, maybe refrigerators, uh, et cetera. Things where the richer you get, there's more of your budget you spend on it. Inferior, um, uh, necessities are things like food, where clearly rich people spend more on food than poor people. But they spell a, spend a smaller share of their budget on food than poor people. Okay, So it goes up. But it doesn't go up proportion with your income. It goes up less than proportion with your income. Yeah? Well, you sort of refer to some sort of like, like human necessities in the sense that like, if you're more like wealthy, you might buy more like name brand food or something like that and spend more than Yeah, that. Once, again, once we get into brands, you can absolutely see that. You can think of luxury brands and necessity brands. Uh, absolutely. But if we think about stay with categories of goods, that, then let's, let, let's think, you think of you know, jewelry as the clinic kind of example here and sort of, you know, Food is the canonical example here. Yeah? Uh, can you, like, do you have any example of something that's like near the border between luxury and necessities? You know, there's a huge industry in estimating these elasticities of demand. So I'm sure there's an answer to that. I don't have it off the top of my head. All right? So that's, so that's basically, so now I've given you the underlying tools of consumer demand theory. I've told you how to decide what quantity a consumer wants. I've told you how you can use that to derive a demand curve. I've explained the shape of the demand curve. I then talked about what happens as your income changes and talked about the shape of income, uh, of the income elasticity. Now I'm going to put this together to come back to revisit something you think you already know the answer to, which is what happens when a price changes, the effects of a price change. Now you might say, well, that's sort of silly. We already did that once this lecture. We already did when we derived the demand curve, effects of price change. When we derived the demand curve, we did some price changes, right? I showed you what happened as the price of cookies change. But in fact, we cheated a little bit and went, we didn't cheat. We gave you sort of the bottom line, but didn't get into the elements of why, that, of why people react the way they do to price changes. Now we're getting to some sort of deep theory. Okay? Now I'm going to talk to you about something. It's deeply theoretical in the sense that in some sense, if all you care about is what happens in the real world, then you just care about when a price change happens, how does quantity change? I'm going to give some theoretical concepts, which are going to become very powerful later on in the course, which are important to understand now, which is how is the underlying decision calculus changed by a price, uh, change when the price changes? And the way we're going to do that is that we're going to decompose your response to a price change into two effects. The substitution effect and the income effect. We're going to separate your response into two effects. The separation is going to become very important later on. The substitution effect we're going to define, we're going to define the substitution effect as the change in the quantity of a good when the price changes holding utility constant. So it's delta Q, delta B, DQ, DP, OK, for shorthand, but holding utility constant at some fixed level U bar. The change in quantities price changes, so it's the elasticity of demand, but at a constant level of utility. 
the income effect is the change in quantity of a good as income changes. Change in quantity dy, which is the income elasticity we talked about. Okay, the change in quantity um, as the income changes. Okay, uh, and this is actually multi technically it's multiplied by the initial level of income. You don't, you, we'll, we'll learn about this in section, but that's technically how the income effect is defined, and you'll come into section about why that is. But we're going to decompose this. So let me. That's sort of confusing. So let me start with graphically to understand it. So let's go to Figure four or five. One of them more complicated figures. Okay. We start at budget constraint one. Same parameters as always. All the math here, all this graphical stuff follows from the math using that utility function and these prices and income. Same as before. So we start as before at point A. Your tangency is the best package you can have given that utility function is six cookies and three slices of pizza. Okay? Now let's change, now let's imagine the price of cookies rises to $9. The price of cookies, in our example, price of cookies goes from $6 to $9. OK, that's the example we're going to analyze. Now, we know from before that will ultimately move you from six cookies to four cookies while holding pizza's constant at three. So we know you'll end up. You'll end up at point C. We did that before. But actually, two things are happening to get you there. The first thing that's happening is the substitution effect which is the change in prices with utility constant. And how do we measure that? We want to ask, given that the price changed, but the utility's constant, how, what's the new quantity you choose? What does utility constant mean in this graph? What does it mean to a utility constant? Let's get some other folks involved here. What does it mean? Yeah. Same indifference curve. So what we want to do is ask, given the new prices, but the old indifference curve, what quantity would you choose? Well, the way we do that is we find the tangency between the new slope of the budget constraint and the old indifference curve. And we do that by drawing sort of an imaginary budget constraint, BC prime. BC prime is a sort of imaginary budget constraint. It's not a real budget constraint, but it has the slope of the new budget constraint, but it's tangent to the old indifference curve. That's the key thing. BC prime, the imaginary budget constraint, the dashed line, has the slope of the new budget constraint, same as the new price ratio. So the slope is the new price ratio. The slope is, um, the slope is now uh, is at the new price ratio. But it's tangent to the old indifference curve. So BC prime is basically going to be tangent to the old indifference curve at point B. So what we're saying is the substitution effect moves you from point A to point B. That is, holding utility constant, but at these new prices, you would choose to have fewer cookies and less pizza. OK? We call this notion compensated demand. Compensated demand. That is, I'm compensating you. I'm holding utility constant. I'm saying price of change sucks for you. You're worse off. Your opportunity set's restricted. But I'm going to compensate you by holding your utility constant. It's called compensated demand. Your compensated demand would mean that when the price goes up, you would choose to reduce your consumption of cookies from 6 to 4.89. OK? Now, here's the key thing about substitution effects. We can sign them definitively. They are always negative. The substitution effect is always negative. OK? Such effect is always negative. The, in the income effect could go other way. We'll show that. Such effect is always negative. Okay? We can see this in two ways. Graphically, think about it this way. You have to be tangent to the same indifference curve with a higher sloped line. So you have to move to the left. Right? If you're tangent to the same indifference curve with a line with a higher slope, it's got to be to the left. So that's a graphical intuition. Mathematically, it's worth writing out the steps because it helps us. Uh, it, that's why we teach it to help remind us of our consumer theory. OK? Step one, you're at this new tangency. OK? Step two, we know that at any such tangency that's optimized, the marge utility of cookies over the marge utility of pizza equals the price of cookies over the price of pizza. We know that's true at any tangency, OK? Because that's the optimal choice. 
Step three, we know PC over PP is up. OK, that's, I just said that in this assumption, so the price of cookies is up. Therefore, that leads to step four, which is that MUC over MUP must be up, because it's still equal. Well, how do you raise the ratio, the marginal utility of cookies to marginal utility of pizzas? How do you accomplish that? By having fewer cookies and more pizza. The way you get, so that means that implies that cookies are up, I'm sorry, cookies are down and pizzas are up, and or pizzas are up. Okay? How do you get that ratio to be higher? Well, remember, this is why I do this math here. Remember the key intuition. More cookies means lower marginal utility of cookies. The more cookies you have, the less you care about the next cookie. So I want the marginal utility of cookies to be lower. If I want the marginal utility of cookies, I'm sorry, to be higher, I've got to have fewer cookies. Or I've got to have more pizza, or both. OK? So the substitution effect is always negative. If I'm going to hold utility constant and change prices and raise a price, you'll always want less of that good from the substitution effect. Okay. Question about the graphics of the math. OK, now let's come to the income effect. The income effect says, the income effect says, hold the income effect is saying holding prices constant. So I should have put this here. The income effect is this at a constant price. Should add that. So the income effect is the change in quantity demanded as income changes, holding prices constant. So now we're saying, the income effect is saying, look, the price changed. So therefore, I shifted my consumption towards, away from cookies. But the other thing that happened is I got poorer. They might say you didn't get poor. Your parents didn't send you less money. But remember, your opportunity set restricted. You effectively are poorer because this price went up. How do we represent that? Well, we can exactly represent that by the shift from BC prime to BC2. Because BC prime and BC2 have the same slope. That shift is just the income effect. So that's holding the prices constant. The price ratio for BC prime and BC2 is the same. Okay? But you're now effectively poor because you, at the same income, you can afford fewer cookies. So you're effectively poor. So now your income's effectively fallen. And at that new budget constraint, with that new lower effective income and higher price ratio, you choose point C. So we got from A to C, just like I told you before, but we actually get there in two steps. One step is sort of the relative change in prices cause say, ooh, I want to get away from cookies. The other say, I'm poor, so I want less of everything, including cookies. OK? So one is the price effect, one's the income effect. And it matters. These two effects matter. Now, in this case, they don't matter because they work together. In this case, you might say, well, look, why do I care? You know, why do I? The bottom line is number of cookies fell by two. Substitution effect work together. Why do I care? Well, you might care because if the income effect is, is because if the good is inferior, then the income and substitution effect work against each other. If the good is inferior, then the income and substitution effects work against each other rather than with each other. To see this, let's go to figure 4, 6. Now we're going to totally change our example. OK? Now we're going to choose between steak and potatoes. Totally different example. Steak and potatoes. You start at budget joint BC1. Potatoes are a dollar, and steak is five dollars. So our new example, in our new example, I'll put this up here. Uh, in our new example, we've got uh, the price of steak is five dollars. The price of potatoes is a dollar. Okay, and your income is twenty-five dollars. That's our new example. Okay, in that case, you will choose, and this is a different utility function. It's just Totally new example. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not expecting you to understand the underlying math here. I'm just showing you an example of something that might be true. Okay? So you choose point A. You choose seven and a half potatoes and three and a half steaks. Okay? Given those, given those prices. Now we're going to say, what happens if the price of potatoes goes from $1 to $3? The price of potatoes goes up. Well, two things happen. First of all, the change in compensated demand 
moves you from point A to point B. How do we know that? Because we draw a new imaginary budget constraint that has the new price ratio, but it's tangent to the old indifference curve. So you're point A to point B. So the substitution effect lowers your demand for potatoes from 7.5 to 4. But the income effect raises your demand for potatoes. Now the income effect means you actually move back from 4 to 5. On net, you're still having fewer potatoes, but the substitution effects went opposite ways. Why? Why did the income effect cause you to want to have more potatoes? Substitution effect wanted to have less. Yeah? Uh, Close. Your price potatoes went up, so are you, you're effectively what? Poorer, right? And when you're poorer, how, how does that affect your consumption of inferior goods? You want more of them, right? So price potatoes went up, so effectively you're poorer. Now, when you're poor, in our previous example with cookies, you want fewer cookies than a normal good. But potatoes are an inferior good. So as you're poor, you want more of them. Zingham effect goes the opposite way of the substitution effect. That's where this starts to get interesting. Zingham effect always goes the same way as substitution effect. This is sort of just a purely useless theoretical exercise. It gets interesting when Zingham effect goes the opposite way of the substitution effect. Yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. OK. Um, so yeah. Uti utility, uh, well, different utility functions will give you uh, different, you have to have a different utility function to get the good to be inferior. So utility of a steak of potatoes could be, is not going to be square root of, you won't get inferiority with square root of P times S. So it's a different utility function. I mentioned that, I think. It's a different utility function. Yeah. It's a different utility function that makes potatoes an inferior good mathematically. Exactly. So basically, your intuition, I gave you intuition why they're inferior, but mathematically it would occur because we'd have a utility function. The utility function would generate an inferior good would be a different looking utility function. Not off the top of my head. But we'll, we'll, we'll do it in section. OK? So the bottom line is, yeah? You said that price mistake in potatoes, is it that they both provide like similar nutritional value? Because like one potato is not necessarily a big one steak, but like the price that they are saying like, $5 for the state is equivalent in terms of my health and will fill me up with as much as. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not writing down a health function. I'm writing, I didn't write it down. It's a utility function. It's, a, it's about filling up. It's about taste. Steak maybe leave me hungrier, but it's way better. So it's not about what fills me up. Literally, all I'm saying is, given my utility function, I don't have the utility function written down, but given my utility function, I was choosing a balance of mostly potatoes and some steak. Now the price of potatoes goes up, I, I, I end up wanting fewer potatoes, but not as few as you might think from the substitution effect because potatoes are inferior. Yeah? No, no. What I'm saying, the income effect is holding the price constant. What happens to your demand? So holding the price constant, what I mean by that is moving from BC prime to BC2 is the income effect. Holding your price constant. So the price change is reflecting the substitution effect. That's reflected in moving from BC1 to BC prime. The income effect is holding the price constant that is given that same slope of that imaginary new budget constraint. You're now poor. So that's why. So it's, it's once again, it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. It's theoretical. But the notion is when a price changes, two things happen. It changes the relative desirability of two goods. And it changes your income, your effective income, your opportunity set. Two things are happening. OK? Yeah? First, uh, like the price first changes, you need to substitute, so you keep your They both, oh no, they both happen at the same time. Let's be clear. This isn't sequential. This is happening in real time. It's not like you said the price went up, I'm going to compute my, you know, it's happening in real time. It's just we're decomposing into two effects. And the reason, is the reason we're doing that is because once goods are inferior, this decomposition becomes interesting. OK? So let's think about, I like to think about this in sort of a simple, a simple table to help sort of remind you how to think about this. So let's think of a simple table. Here we have the price change. OK, so um, the price can go up, can go up, or the price can go down, up and down. Here we have the substitution effect. Here we have the income effect. And here we have the total. OK, well, in the case of a normal good, so in the case of a normal good, if a good is normal, then we know the substitution effect, when the price goes up, leads you to want less of a good. 
The income effect also leads you to want less of a good. So you definitely want less of the good. These are all equals. You know, there's, all, there's always corner cases. Okay. Likewise, when the price falls, the substitution effect might you want more of the good. When the price falls, you're effectively richer. So the income effect makes you want more of the good. So you clearly want more of the good. OK, that's the easy case. The more interesting case is what if it's an inferior good? Now, if the price goes up, the substitution effect is the same. Substitution effect is always negative. A higher price means you substitute away from the good. But the income effect is now positive. So the net is unclear. Likewise, if the price goes down, price goes down, the substitution effect is always positive. You always want more of the good if the price goes down. But the income effect is now you want less of the good. Why? Because you're richer. If the price of a good falls, you're richer. Richer means you want less of that inferior good. So the net effect is unclear. So the interesting case becomes inferior goods. OK? Questions about the table. So this raises the question, are there goods? What does this imply? If this was actually, if this was, if the income effect dominated the substitution effect, you could get what? Yeah. Yes, you could get an upward sloping demand curve. You could actually theoretically get an upward sloping demand curve. And we call this a Giffen good. A Giffen good is a good where you get an upward sloping demand curve, where actually the inferior income effect is so large it dominates the substitution effect. And you actually get an upward sloping demand curve that a higher price leads uh, people who want more of the good. Now, in fact, this is named after Giffen, some guy Giffen, I guess. It probably was a guy, because it's old. Okay? Um, uh, but in fact, it's convenient because it's close to the word Griffin, and Griffins are imaginary, and so are Giffins. Okay? It's actually hard to find examples in reality of Giffen goods. Okay? It's actually pretty hard to find examples in reality. Okay? But there was um, one interesting experiment that was run, which is sort of the first convincing evidence that in some situations, Giffen goods could exist. So they ran the following experiment. They ran a study in China where um, very, very poor households, they based all house, most households in China are poor, but they basically divided the super poor versus moderately poor households. Okay? And they basically gave them coupons which lowered the price of rice, which was their staple good. Okay, they basically, they eat rice, and that's sort of their basic good they eat. And they basically lowered the price of rice. What they found is that for families that weren't super poor, they found a typical downward sloping demand curve. Given the coupon off rice meant they bought more rice. But for the very, very poor families, they actually did find an upward sloping demand curve. Giving them a discount on the price of rice actually caused them to have less rice. Because they were, they were, it was, because literally that's all they ever ate was rice. So by definition, they could have had more because they didn't eat anything else. Now that you're essentially saying, look, you used to eat all rice, you spend your whole budget on rice, now I've basically given you extra money. Because all that rice you used to eat, you can now have cheaper. Are you going to spend that to buy more rice? No, you're going to buy something else. And that's a Giffen good. So you can think, if you think about sort of a corner solution when people are buying all of a good that's inferior, then by definition, if you give them more money, they're going to move on to another good. Or there's at least a possibility. And that's a Giffen good example. But we have to search pretty darn hard. Typically, in the demand context, we think that demand curves are downward sloping. However, when we get to other contexts, we're going to find it's more normal to find that these income and substitution effects fight against each other and lead to strange shaped curves. And we'll come back to that later in the course. OK? Um, OK, I'll see you all Wednesday.